Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, based on wherever you are. Scott Luton and special guest host Rob Tiffany here with you on the latest edition of This Week in Business History Live. Rob, how you doing? Good, good. How's it going, Scott? Uh, doing wonderful. Uh, I'm just living with green eyes over here. So jealous of your uh, road trips <laughs> and uh, your culinary adventures. I mean, you really have been living the good life these last couple months, huh? Absolutely. It's been great. Spent a lot of money on gasoline. <laughs> <laughs> and even, I, believe, I believe that. Uh, but even uh, as recently as this morning, you had a really cool adventure uh, that we may touch on a little later on. But uh, man, so glad you're here with us for Biz History Live. Thanks for carving some time out. Absolutely. Happy to be here. All right. So, folks, uh, you may know, many of you know, uh, that bit here at Biz History, we focus on lesser known stories of leaders and innovation at the intersection of, you guessed it, business and history. So we drop a new podcast episode every Tuesday, including the replays of our live sessions like this one here today with, with the one only Rob Tiffany. In addition to the live replays, we've got these handcrafted masterpieces that Kelly Barner turns out in her sleep. Um, what kind what's your favorite donut, uh, Rob? I like the old fashioned, the old fashioned by Duncan, I guess. <laughs> No, not from Duncan. Um, you know, actually, there's a uh, God, there's a place in Seattle, and I forgot the name. Krispy Kreme's pretty awesome when the hot lights on. Okay, so Kelly Barner cranks out these episodes that are as delicious as the old fashioned or just original at Krispy Kreme when that lights yeah. on. How about that? I'm all in. So Absolutely. now that you and I and all all of our listeners and family members are going to go get a Krispy Kreme tonight, uh, one more one more little note here. Because I want to make sure folks know the last episode that Kelly dropped was all about John Wanamaker, uh, what she, who she deemed a merchant prince of Philadelphia. So, Rob, I won't do his story justice, but John Wanamaker was the first person to use that phrase department store, the first person to use written price tags. Wow. And a variety of other firsts right there in Philadelphia. So, John Wanamaker, y'all can check that out. At, Way to go, John. Um, <laughs> that's right. How about that? Makers. Yeah, I've uh, heard of it. <laughs> so so beyond Rob, of course, uh, quick shout out to our incredible production team. Catherine's with us here today. Look forward to their comments. Uh, she says she loves chocolate donuts with sprinkles or Rob, the ones rolled in cinnamon sugar. How about those? Yes, those little tiny donuts, and you see them come off. Have you seen it? And like, oh, say, so if you're in Seattle at Pike Place Market, there's a place called like the Daily Dozen, and those Ooh. little tiny hot ones are coming up, and then they put it in a paper bag, and they just pour cinnamon sugar, hold up the bag, and start shaking it. Oh, that's heaven Soul. on earth. So, oh, yeah. Uh, so, thank you, Catherine, for adding to uh, my um, hunger for donuts, both you and Rob, right now. Uh, let's see here. Uh, big thanks to Amanda, also part of the production team, helped make today, uh, today's live stream happen. Hey, look at this, Rob. You know Ryan Treese. What? Look Ryan. At Rob, Rob Tiffany, IOT legend. How about Ooh. that, Rob? Well, that's awesome. Ryan is my bro. He's keeping it real for us down in Austin. I so, love it. Absolutely. What, a great, what a great city in Austin. So, Ryan, welcome in. Looking forward to hearing any of your thoughts around the uh, top five list we're going to we're going to tackle here today. So, Rob, back to our um, my game plan here. So, again, every other Tuesday uh, at 4 p.m. Eastern time, we go live. We want to hear from our listeners. Right. This is your chance to come in, talk about the stories we're going to talk about here today or any of our past episodes. I think we're approaching 60 episodes with Biz History. Um, Rob, really quick, I want to make sure uh, IOT. Coffee chat, I think, uh, is one of your lot. What's that, Rob? Almost. Yeah, it's IoT Coffee Talk, and we record it every Wednesday morning. We're every a bunch morning. of YouTubers who are <laughs> irreverent. You know, it's like watching Sports Center. I know. IoT. I've seen them. You keep <laughs> uh, a bunch of smart. Uh, it's a very smart uh, ESPN conversation with the likes of you and some of your uh, <laughs> distinguished guests. So y'all check that out every Wednesday morning. What time, Rob? eight Pacific, but it's not live. So don't worry about it. We just record it that time. And then it goes up on YouTube. Hey, uh, it, it's good times. I've seen lots of episodes. Uh, you, uh, in fact, I discovered you on Twitter. And, and as I started to piece together, who is Rob Tiffany? It's like, goodness gracious. Uh, we also found out that folks listen to our veteran voices series, Rob, you're a fellow veteran served in the U S Navy, 
aboard a submarine. We've had some interesting stories you've shared there as well, huh? It says a lot about my mental state that I used to serve on submarines. So yeah, it was good times. It is such a, um, um, a, a different type of, uh, of, of service uh, yeah. that a lot of folks don't know about. So maybe we'll have to drop the link to the episode uh, in the chat. But all right, so I digress. Uh, we've got five interesting historical moments to share here today, Rob, our top five list. Are you ready to dive in? And we might have lost. Let's see if Rob is still with us. Bear with us. Live streaming has its hiccups from time to time. And Rob was tuned in from the road. We're going to give him just a minute. All right. So, you know, sometimes I just removed him, uh, Catherine and Amanda, from the live stream. We'll give Rob a minute to see if we can get him reconnected. And we'll bring him right back into the stream um, so we can get into our top five list. I'll tell you, Catherine and Amanda, nothing is quite as challenging as killing some time in monologue mode. And it looks like Rob is going to be reconnecting with us. So uh, that, <laughs> that's what Ryan says. That was just Rob's poker face. Well, he has got an outstanding poker face. I'll tell you, Ryan. Uh, so thanks so much for being here. Amanda says, Chocolate frosted donuts will be her downfall. How about that? And Amanda and Catherine, thanks for dropping Rob's appearance on Veteran Voices in the chat there. Fascinating stuff. Not only do we tackle uh, Rob's experience serving aboard a, uh, aboard a submarine, but then all of his uh, uh, te technological trail trailblazing he has done as part of his journey. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and dive into one of the stories here today. And then I'm going to keep a, a finger on the pulse of our, our guest line. And we're going to get Rob back in here soon so that we can uh, share, some, uh, uh, share some examples of um, five historical occurrences that are loosely tied into this week. And I think we've got Rob back. Let's see. Hey, hey Rob. Hey, how you doing? Does, you know what? I felt like I was frozen in cryo sleep, like Han Solo there for a second. <laughs> uh, I thought it out and I'm back. Well, hey. But I'm not very um, back, obviously, because. Yeah, the... All right, let me let me try to find some better. I don't know how my Wi-Fi just disappeared on me. Now I'm tethered and I'm going to try to get back on here. I apologize. All good. All, no, all good. Piece of cake. We're Piece good? of cake. Okay. No Are pressure. we good? Yes. Yes, I've got you. Can you all hear right. me? I can hear you. Okay. All right. All we're right. tethering. We're let's tethering. Get, <laughs> okay. Let's get, let's give this a go. Uh, so let's Rob, give it a go. Check this out. So number one on our list, Rob, I want my MTV. So on Saturday, August 1st, 1981 at precisely 12.01 AM Eastern time, MTV was launched with the simple words, ladies and gentlemen, rock and roll. Of course, the legendary first music video to play on MTV was, Rob, do you remember? Radio killed the radio. Oh, okay, it's Video <laughs> yes. Killed the Radio Star by the Buggles. Yes, Rob, yes. man, yes. right on cue. Nice, nicely done. Um, so, but did you know this? Initially at launch, MTV was only broadcast to homes in New Jersey. But of course, that would change as the channel became more popular and influential, leading to broad global access So get this rob by 1983 revenues mtv would be 27 million dollars right we're talking just um, a couple years after launch and by 1992 which was arguably the peak of the mtv brand at least in how it was initially conceived the channel in 19, 1992 reached 112 million homes and hit over 400 million in revenue big year do you remember the year 1992 rob and we may have lost Rob again. You might have. Okay. Oh, you no. <laughs> You're back. I was right actually launching in the Saturn V rocket on MTV. You know what? The reason I left you is I decided to uh, just kind of go into a time warp. I honestly, if I could just 
sit around and watch like the first maybe one, two, three years of MTV continuously, I would probably do it. I'm with you, Rob. It yeah. is so, I tell you, for many of our listeners now, um, it, it was so different than what MTV is today. We're going to touch on that in just a second. Uh, did you know the MTV Mu uh, Video Music Awards, uh, Rob, would debut in 1980, 1984, 1984, mm -hmm. and the VMAs have become one of its most watched annual events. In fact, going back to this Moon Man, yeah. right, to the right, which was right. part of the original branding of the launch, that's where the VMA award comes from. Yeah, right? the trophy, the little Moon Man was what you get. That's right. I think that's and much better than an Oscar. <laughs> I agree with you. Space space is much cooler. Space than is much. much cooler. Absolutely. Uh, now, of course, now in 2022, as we we're talking about, MTV looks a lot different. Music videos are nowhere to be found, but you will find, Rob, lots of ridiculousness episodes, yes. which, Rob, um, that's a story in of itself. I watched a YouTube deep dive into how that came, uh, came to be. Yeah. Um, and, you know, hey, I'm not I'm not throwing stones. Uh, ridiculousness is really, it's a funny, it is funny. Uh, funny TV show led by a fellow entrepreneur, but it's amazing how that has permeated as I think it's still the majority uh, type of programming on MTV. Wow. It's just a bunch that? of old Gen Xers saying, where are the music videos? You know, <laughs> what the heck? Yeah, no, I totally get it. Yeah. Like ridiculousness. Yeah. That I can get sucked into that pretty easily. <laughs> I yeah. can too. Absolutely. I can too. <laughs> My middle child, She's addicted to it. She always wants it as we sit down for dinner. Okay. So as we start to wrap this first item, there's, uh, I want Did to talk you mention about Duran Duran, by the way. I have not. I have not. Uh, any of those big 1980s MTV bands and early 90s that made a big presence, I have not mentioned. Who else would you add in that category of Duran Duran? I mean, cause, yeah, because so much of what the 80s were and what MTV did, there was this whole subculture, this whole new wave thing that happened in the 80s. And a lot of these songs were only played in clubs mm. and they were never played on the radio um, until later on. But you got to see these obscure artists on MTV that you never would have heard of, you know, like, um, God, what's the, you know, haircut 100 right. or just how about the buggles, the, the what buggles. they live with? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I'm on a Mexican radio. Who would have ever heard that on mainstream radio, you know? Well Rob, you're so right. One of the things, as, as we were researching for this first story, uh, many radio stations were talking you know, across the country were getting phone calls, getting requests that they'd never heard of, to your point exactly. And that was part of the MTV effect. Yeah. Um, so let me share. I want, psychedelic I want to Furs. What's the, that? Psychedelic Furs. The Cure. I mean, we can, you know, New Order. We can just go on forever. Those were never. Those weren't mainstream bands. Oh, they uh, were in. They were in, in in UK, I guess, but not in America. You know, you might even put. Uh, and now, you know, most folks would know REM as yeah. one of the world's greatest rock and roll bands. But in college its earliest band. incarnation, that's right. It was from a college band. That's right. Right down the road in Athens, GA. Absolutely. Um, yeah. All right. Oh, B fifty twos. Yes, B fifty twos. Yes, Love Shack, baby. All right, so we're going to have the MTV version of Biz History Live here in just a second. But, but Rob, uh, switching over to the business side, uh, Adam Bear over at The Conversationalist, when, we, when he talked about uh, the biggest ways that MTV shaped the course of business history, content history, however you want to put it, he kind of boiled it down to three things, at least from what I read. Number one, MTV's ability to move records was significant, as we're all talking about, especially in the 80s and early 90s. Two, cable networks, which... Uh, were made up of popular channels like MTV, like uh, USA Network, like HBO, maybe. You know, those were some of the first blows to the dominant traditional broadcast networks, right? And we all yeah. see how that's continued to evolve today. Right. And then thirdly, MTV was also amongst the early, earliest of trailblaz uh, trailblazers and the globalization of content and media. You know, think of it. Uh, they launched sister channels like MTV Europe, MTV Brazil, and... Unique content, Rob. Yeah. Do you remember uh, the the show that has been copycatted a thousand times or more? The Real World. The Real right? World. Yes, everybody's copy that. Yes, where was reality TV before the Real World should it didn't have exist? Right? Real World invented it. You're absolutely right. That was so, crazy. It, so let me get your get your take. Uh, I want to ask you about your favorite show 
right? Because um, there's a variety of game, from game shows to, of course, music shows and DJs and all that stuff. But before we talk that, you know, when you think of the impact, the business history impact of MTV, what else comes to your mind? Well, you used to have, obviously, it was all about bands and mostly, you know, and, and the, the videos. And you went from uh, making records and the DJ, you, you, your success or failure as a band was dependent on DJ playing your, your song on the right. radio. And then you moved to this deal where now you're starting off with cheesy videos where maybe they're just standing on the stage with a guy with a, a camera. And then pretty soon you got high production values. And so it became like a Hollywood thing. And then there was no such thing as launching an album and a hit song without an accompanying video. And a lot of people who weren't in bands, but maybe were background dancers or things like that, they ended up making it in other things too. Um, so right. It, 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 and so, yeah, it, you know, it really galvanized a, an industry there. Um, I'm sure you're thinking of something totally different, but <laughs> That's what came to my mind, my no. simple, my simpleton brain. That's not no, that's not simpleton. I would say that is the artistic side yeah. of that of that question and that answer. So I love that, Rob. Uh, one thing I'd add, and I, I want to get your favorite show on MTV in the olden, the the the, the hmm. golden days of MTV, maybe we'll call it. But uh, arguably, based on what I was looking at, uh, one of my son's favorite songs, "Bohemian Rhapsody" by Queen, they. Uh, at least by a couple sources, have the distinction of having the first true modern day music video. Did you know that, Rob? I didn't know that. Now the Beatles and other groups experimented right sure. with with the video side of music, but uh, yeah. that is one of Queen's many many contributions to Can the. Can we art. ever hear that song come on when you're driving the car and not start? Right. <laughs> <laughs> if like you're gonna spew, yeah. <laughs> spew in this cup i mean i can't separate that song from wayne's world right but hey i digress mtv right. made a lot of movies and mtv makes shows that you don't think are associated with mtv and so while you're looking for an old show from me i'm gonna say something that people will not expect what's the Please. number one show on tv for the last few years oh then it's called yellowstone oh yeah that's it right place in montana you might be surprised when it first comes on, you see the moon man from MTV and you're like, what? Kevin Costner and all these cowboys and Rip right. taking you down to the train station. They're hanging out with those MTV kids. <laughs> it's a thing. Though. I'm not yeah. lying. <laughs> well, we're going to have to, you know, we're going to, we're going to make that be one of our next uh, uh, subjects for uh, biz history live. Uh, further exploring all the different ways MTV's got its uh, fingers and toes into modern mm -hmm. successful content. Hey, really quick, Amanda says she loved watching VMA, the VMAs back in the day in TRL, which was Total Request Live. Remember that, yes, Rob? Yes, I did. I did. That was pretty cool. She was I also a big it. fan of the real world. Real and I'll world tell you, awesome. Rob, I'm not sure if you're a fan, but she and I both are big fans of Big Brother these days, which I think is in its 23rd or 24th season, which again, it was a byproduct of yeah, the, real, the real world. The world. It was. All I right. haven't watched that in a while. It's been a while. You know, All some right. shows are on so long, I thought they weren't on anymore. <laughs> I, I can relate. We got so much. We have so much between streaming and TV and Roku, all the stuff. So yeah. much to choose from, right? Totally. Um, finally. So think back, Rob, in the 80s and early 90s, the MTV, kind of the um, its first chapter right? Uh, when mm -hmm. it was closest to how it was launched, what is one of your favorite shows from the golden age of MTV? Shows? Yeah. Um, wasn't there one called, well, remember they had the news th news show, like, was it 90 minutes, 60 With minutes? Kurt Loader, yes. Kurt Loader, I yep. totally remember that. <laughs> uh, um, You're going to have uh, a blast. Let me, let me suggest one to you, because this me. is going to be a blast I'm, from the past. I'm really struggling. Well, hey, we, we got so much else between our ears these days, okay, right? Right. Um, remote control. Do you remember that game show where you had three contestants sitting in recliners? Yes, I do. And I can't remember the host's name, but oh, the guy God. from Saturday Night Live, Colin Quinn, Colin was his Quinn. sidekick. Yeah. Right. Oh my gosh. And when they would get, when the first loser would yeah. would um, uh, be dismissed, they would fall back into the wall. Remember this, Rob? Remote I control. I do. You know, having them fall back into the wall, kind of, it's kind of <laughs> like Dr. Evil pushing the button and you're like, people die. Yes. Yeah. Um, I love it. 
And yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Amanda, for making us all feel old. 77. Makes me feel 70. young. <laughs> Man, no kidding. Goodness gracious. Okay. Well, um, enough about MTV, although we could make the full hour about MTV. I think totally. you and I both were big fans. Um, Valley Girl. <laughs> Early on. The Moon Unit. Oh, well, and all and right. Dweezil, so one more. Remember Moon Unit and Dweezil started yes. doing a show on there. Remember, they were VJs for a while. That is right. Rob, I completely forgot that. And all everyone's right. favorite all-American sweetheart was Martha Quinn. That's right. Yeah. Man, you, you are really, you, uh, it's all coming back to you. I can see it's it. It's all coming back. Hey, well, the monkeys, um, you know, one of my favorite, my mom's favorite bands growing up. And then I became a fan from her fandom and then what sealed the deal. And why I know just about every word of, of at least all the popular monkey songs mm -hmm. is MTV started putting that old sitcom from the sixties in its rotation to kind of fill time. Mm -hmm. And then because it became popular and there were some, there were some demographics there, uh, other local TV stations, you know, even broadcast stations we're doing the same. Wow. And next thing you know, in 1986, the monkeys came out with a, a new best of album with like two or three new songs. Who knew? Seriously. So this yeah. is the impact that MTV had. Yeah. Um, all right. So we're going to, you know, I wish that um, Rob, I don't, I don't want to throw stones to anybody. I wish our second story was as, as fun and as exciting as our first one, but Hey, there's a place for everybody. I guess let's so. talk. <laughs> let's talk, Rob, uh, Jenny Craig, this is a remarkable entrepreneurial story, amongst other things. So uh, Jenny Craig was born Genevieve Goudros. I think I got that right. On August 7th, 1932 in Berwick, Louisiana. Rob, right after she gave birth to her second child and she's in the gym trying to lose weight, Jenny Craig determined that there weren't a lot of solid, healthy, sustainable options for folks like her. And she came to believe around that same time that weight loss wasn't just about exercising, but the diet, your diet was equally as important. Right. So this is where the entrepreneurial play comes in. So Jenny Craig would marry her entrepreneurial husband, Sidney Craig, in 1979. Together, they would grow and sell a rather large company called BCI in the early 1980s. So with lots of money to bank, the couple decided to go on an adventure, probably much like Rob, your adventure over the last uh, couple of months, it feels. Uh, uh, Jenny and Sydney Craig decided to go on an adventure and would end up in Australia, but not just because they're throwing darts at a map. Yeah. It was all focused and deliberate. So get this, Jenny Craig was already thinking about what was next, uh, in their, uh, business journey. And they wanted to found a nutrition based business. Uh, and they chose Australia because largely there were several dietary food manufacturers that it Craig's wanted to work with that were based in Melbourne. That was one a there's one B when they sold BCI, they had a two year non-compete mm. here in the States. Ah, so those you. two <laughs> things kind of took them to Australia, right? Right. So get this shortly after moving to Australia, Jenny Craig would open close to 95 offices across Australia within the first couple of years. These, you know, the Jenny Craig centers. Uh, and once that non-compete was up, I mean, to the hour, Jenny, and Sydney were on a plane headed to Los Angeles where they were going to open up the North America market. And they didn't mess around. Rob, right away, they opened up 12 offices throughout LA as they opened up the US market. And it took off. In short order, the Jenny Craig concept took off like sugar free hotcakes. I had to add in the sugar free there. Ooh. And they began, <laughs> they began. Sign me up for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, who said that the maple syrup can be full of the sugar? You know, because we could feel yeah, better okay. about sugar-free cool. hotcakes. Okay. <laughs> um, they began expanding across the U.S. Jenny Craig, the entrepreneur, right, that the person credits a large part of their competitive advantage to the fact that they had frozen food products, try to say that three times fast, in each yeah. center right there, easily accessible to their clients. So no extra trip to the grocery store where you might not have your dietitian right there keeping you in line with what you're going to you're going to eat the next week or two. Right. So the big focus, sense. it makes, it does make a lot of sense. Is right. It's, you've got the customer right there in the office. Yeah. Hey, close the deal, right? Close the deal. Always be closing. <laughs> ABC. That's right. Another great movie. Um, <laughs> so I, I want to get your take on this in a second. Big focus on frozen foods. Also a big focus on running the fast growing company in a very entrepreneurial manner. In fact, in many interviews, Jenny Craig talks about, Hey, if something wasn't working, 
they'd make a change. They had a backup plan. They'd have to go through a board to get it done. So the company went even bigger in subsequent years, focusing on helping folks go smaller. And the industry took notice. In fact, big time global brand Nestle would buy Jenny Craig in 2004. And as of 2022, Jenny Craig has some 1,100 plus locations worldwide. Wow. Now, I had no idea. I mean, talk about, you know, we were talking about a second ago, um, you know, uh, some of the things we didn't even know were still there. Yeah. I'd have had I no idea about this Jenny Craig story and, and 1,100 locations still thriving in many ways. Oh, way back in the day, but yeah. yes, but I'm not, I, I wouldn't, I had no idea. I didn't realize Nestle bought them. Okay. Good so, on her. Way to go, Jenny. <laughs> That's right. By Look. the way, just to annoy you further, you know, one of the times when you said Jenny Craig, it sounded like the way Forrest Gump would say, Jenny. <laughs> So anyway, sorry folks for that irreverent non-business history. No, keep it coming. Keep okay. it coming. I get it honest. Uh growing up in Aiken, South Carolina, I get it. I've honest. been to Aiken. Really? What's it's a, micro, Aiken? a microclimate? Really? It has a microclimate. It's cooler there than it should be. All right, Rob, we're gonna have to. You just blown my mind. We're gonna have and to a lot of rich that. people used to have giant houses there back in the olden days. <laughs> right. I know well, that. And at one time, Aiken, South Carolina was the polo capital of the world because a lot of folks would bring their horses. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and it's still a big uh, polo and horse training mecca. You know, Summer Squall, who won the Kentucky Derby back in the 80s, was trained in Aiken. That's, that's, that's one of the things Aikenites talk about a lot. Reminisce awesome. on. That's but, a great uh, anyway. town. It really is. And I love Jenny Craig. I'm just saying <laughs> that. I, don't bar I barely remember Jenny. <laughs> Um, but it was a thing. It was kind of like she was hot when Jane Fonda was hot doing her aerobics in the eighties. Right. Yes. You know, yes. I'm a big fan when you're an entrepreneur, you need every bit of help you can get. And I'm a big fan of riding waves that are already out there in the market. And you know, if you can, if it makes sense, don't pound a square peg in a round hole, but when there are mega trends and you can hop on that mega trend, it makes life easier. And so there was that movement in the eighties of fitness and aerobics, aerobicize, Jane Fonda had her tapes, and all of a sudden there's Jenny Craig. And, and so there was a lot of momentum, and a lot of people are more willing, had the incentive to, to jump on that bandwagon. And I think it yes. worked out great for her. And having the frozen food, that's also a good thing you do in business. How do I reduce friction for the customer uh, to, to consume my product? I need to make that as easy as possible. And so having the frozen foods, having it in all those locations, Gosh, just make it stupid simple for the customer. Rob, man, you're you're bringing a nuanced, savvy perspective, just like I know you would as part of today's live. Uh, and 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 to your point, who wants to make one more stop on their way home as you're fighting yeah. the kids in the back seat? I mean, to have it right there, eliminate that stop. But one other thing you mentioned um, is not only did they know when to hop on what was out there, they knew to hop off and yes. exit the business, and and I'm sure they did pretty well. Um, all right. Go Nestle. Go Nestle. That's right. I spent a lot um, of time at their headquarters in Switzerland. It's a beautiful place. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I did a lot of work for him when I was at Microsoft. Interesting, man. Uh, the layers to Rob Tiffany Just are endless. Feeling <laughs> okay. All right. So Rob, uh, before we get, you know, so we just knocked out the first two uh, stories on our top five list here today for business history live. Uh, before we go any further, you know, I've had a, I've had um, a great opportunity to get to know you better when you made the Veteran Voices appearance, which we dropped that link here. Folks want to check that out and learn more about your your uh, U.S. Navy journey and a lot more. Um, but let's make sure folks kind of get a sense of uh, all three folks who don't know Rob Tiffany, that what you're up to. So tell, talk to us about Digital Insights and what you do there. Yeah. So Digital Insights, a startup. I started this spring. Um, and so you know, you should probably do things that you know well, right? Um, and so uh, I've had a long history of, obviously, I originally am a software developer. I'm an architect. I spent most of my career at Microsoft and then building giant industrial IoT stuff uh, there and at Hitachi. And so taking all that know-how um, and kind of doing a few things with it. Um, one of it, I have a since I still write code because I'm a total power nerd and know how to build all that stuff, um, I built this product. It's called Net Perceptor. Imagine taking an industrial IoT platform and merging it with a digital twin platform, which there's not many of those. A lot of people talk about digital twins 
very few of them actually ever seen one in the in the wild. Sure. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, but I had I had this experience with digital twins at Hitachi. We you know early on, like 2016, started creating you know a platform so that you could build it. So anyway, the platform I built, you can visually compose and digitally create these digital twins. A digital twin is a digital representation of a physical object or a right. system or process, something like that. And so, uh, so I've been building that. Um, and so I'm gonna, you know, I'm kind of at the MVP 10-ish stage right now. Right. And so right. ready to do some trials with it uh, this summer. And, uh, and so that's fun. And then just, you know, been consulting, you know, and so consulting, you know, again, around industry 4.0, digital sure. transformation, that kind of stuff and training. Well, I love teaching. I think well, I'm a uh, teacher first and foremost. I can de I can see that by the truckload, but you know you're a real humble guy, and and I want to make sure again for the three people that don't don't know Rob Tiffany. I mean you're world renowned for your impact and knowledge and expertise on a variety of different technology subjects from IoT to to the cloud and a lot more. So uh, I'm excited about digital insights. What you're doing? Quick question. Yeah. Uh, getting ready for the trials. Can companies, um, will you keep that internally? Or if comp if a company's hearing this, can yeah. they approach it and kind of volunteer to Absolutely. Be part of the trial? Absolutely. You know, connect, collect, analyze, act. Okay. That's what Love we're it. doing. Well, I think we've got Rob's uh, uh, social uh, uh, links in the episode uh, notes so y'all can connect and, and reach out that way. And of course, if you can't, reach out through Supply Chain Now and, and This Week in Business History and we'll get you connected. Awesome. Um, one other quick personal note uh, that I really enjoyed you speaking about on our last conversation on Veteran Voices is the books you've authored. I mean, you, you've got some some really well-received books and you even have forayed or made a foray. I'm using the words wrong. It's not a verb, I guess. You've made a foray into the children's book world. So tell us, out of yes. all your publications, what has been your favorite thing to compose? Absolutely creating Submarine Warriors, which is a children's book. So yeah, I guess I've published eight or 10 business books, computer technology books, um, things like that, strategy. Uh, but no doubt about it. And what makes it, you know, Submarine Warriors, you know, it's a sci-fi-ish adventure kind of deal with kids. Think about Spy Kids meets yep. Hunt for Red October. Right. Um, that would be the log line, as we say in the <laughs> book industry, right? right. Um, and so, uh, but you do that for a movie too, right? Uh, let me tell you what was really neat about making, writing that story. You know, obviously, you know, we talked about just earlier. You, there's things you know, go with what you know, right? right. Write about what you know. So I knew about submarines and how am I going to tie in fantasy adventure stuff like that into it. And so as I'm writing it, writing this book and my kids are growing up and at night I would read them like a bedtime story might be a chapter, one of the chapters from the book. And so my kids got to play an active role. In fact, my kids, a lot of my kids, and other cousins and other things, they're all in the book because oh, awesome. uh, the kids basically like so many movies you see where the kids have to, suit up and take, you know, their parents have been taken right. captive and the kids have to save the day. So it's like, like, like that. And so uh, it was great, but, but also you're an adult and you're trying to write in a child's voice or mm. a young teen's voice. And sometimes you could screw that up. Um, and so it was important to bounce that stuff off my kids. Would, would someone your age talk like this? Would they say these things, you know? Right. And so it was important to get the voice right. Uh, when writing that. And so I love doing that. Uh, I did all these speaking tours. I do all these things. I'd go to junior highs and elementary schools. And, uh, but also there's a lot of tech. I would also do these things where I would teach kids the science of submarines. And so if you think it's crazy that I could teach fifth graders on a whiteboard, how nuclear fission works and a reactor works on the, but I did it. <laughs> I, be hey, I believe it. I believe it. And I bet they left there with a certification that day. That's right. Um, Submarine Warriors. And, and I'm writing a sequel right now. That's what, what I was about to ask you about that. Yes. So you're, you're putting the sequel together. It's, it's clearly a, a labor of love. It is. And it's called Underworlders Strike Back. Uh, ooh. Gee, I wonder where that idea came from, Star Wars. Uh. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, um, 
fascinating. I, I tell you, I love your mix of, of industry work and, and well-respected, well-read, very popular industry work. And then, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, clearly a passionate project for kids literature, which I can only imagine how complex to your point it is to, to, to put a compelling story in their voice. Um, so that, that's awesome. I appreciate you sharing and make sure when that sequel gets published for under, the the strike, under, underworlders strike back underworlders strike back you gotta send us a link and we the first Those are the to get a terrifying copy. underworld creatures that these kids discover in the first book that have been oh. living beneath the sea floor for evil. thousands of years evil empire the evil oh, empire absolutely <laughs> and the second book is getting a lot scarier oh, i love it but it's kind of like harry potter books they got a lot more serious and adults and scarier as they went along too so it's kind of <laughs> like that <laughs> All right. So thank you for sharing again. Uh, look forward to getting updates on digital insights and also getting updates on uh, all the different projects and including books you've got on your plate. Um, all right. So let's keep driving our top five, uh, getting back to technology behemoths uh, back in 1997, wonder twin powers united because Microsoft teamed up with Apple. So Rob for story number three, tell us more. Oh, wow. There you go. Um, Actually, that's probably more recent, but, you know, <laughs> rest in peace, Steve Jobs. Mm. So for those of you who haven't been alive for the last 30 or 40 years and seen a million shows about this in movies, you know, you might all remember when Steve Jobs was fired from Apple after the Mac came out, didn't sell as well. And, you know, he had a personality and, and Scully didn't like him. And so Scully got the board on his side and they fired him. And then Steve goes out and he starts a new business, kind of like me starting my own new business called Next Computers. It was going to be a no compromise computing system. You know who his first, speaking of business, his first backer was, do you? Does anybody uh, know this? And also, who was it? do you know, well, uh, do you know how venture capitalists often say we're funding the founders because we believe in them? Yes. We don't even care about what you're building. Yes. So when Steve Jobs left, he got a phone call from Ross Perot and Ross Perot said, whatever you're doing, I'm going to back you. Wow. That's a big deal. Ross Perot, billionaire, well known back then, uh, probably wow. younger people don't know who he is now. Um, that was a big deal. So Ross Perot and he created next. Ultimately, Apple almost completely went out of business. The, the story was at about 90 days from shutting off the lights at Apple in the late nineties. So they acquired his company next um, and they got him and that's how Steve came back and uh, he became the CEO and you can watch lots of shows about it. He famously, there's so many good business things to learn there. He looked at what they were making. He's like, you're making too many products. And they're like, what? We need to have big product line and all this stuff. He's like, no, no, no. He canceled so many products till there was just a handful of things left. He famously got with this guy called Johnny Ive, who's this amazing designer who created this iMac bubbly colored thing, but these guys would go on to make the iPod and the iPhone and all these other things. But it, back in that moment in 97, they were barely alive. They were on life support. Microsoft was blowing them out of the water. Steve Jobs would go, well, of course you are because I was gone all that time. <laughs> and, you know, and you got a nice uh, assist as, what did he say? You know, you got a, you were riding on the back of a Saturn V rocket called IBM that gave you, you know, an advantage, right. you know, right. and obviously, and so, uh, and so famously at a, the Mac world event, then Steve is on there. And then all of a sudden there's a screen that comes above him and it's Bill Gates. And you can imagine Mac people, Apple people don't like Microsoft people. Right. I don't know if that's changed or not, but it was <laughs> venomous, violent back then. And so they're all booing and hissing, but Bill was throwing a lifeline to Steve, uh, I know $150 million that he gave him doesn't sound like a lot of money today, but it was a lot of money back in the 90s. Mm. And it was to keep the lights on and rescue them. But there was other parts. Of course, there's going to be some strings attached, like Microsoft Office and making him use the Internet Explorer browser on the Mac and things <laughs> like that. But uh, but yeah, it was a bit, but you know what? It, but Steve Jobs, he's thought of, obviously, he's super creative. He's probably the greatest marketer ever. I, at me as a keynote speaker, there's no one I've studied more than Steve Jobs wow. on how to deliver the best presentations. He's the best. Yeah. Him and Guy Kawasaki and a few others. Um, mm. 
And, but he's a shrewd businessman and he knew even though his fan base was going to hate him for it, he had to do this and he had mm -hmm. to do now, what people don't realize though, is Microsoft was one of the first software vendors to make anything for Apple, for the Apple II and Mac and things like that. All the different products that they had before windows was really much of a thing. Right. Um, and so there's always this intertwined love hate thing going on between Microsoft and Apple back then. And it goes on until today. It's probably not as much love hate now as it was. Uh, most people use office on the, I'm, I'm, Believe it or not, I was a lifelong Microsoft employee, and I'm on my MacBook Pro with wow. my M1 Max CPU, Apple Silicon, but I'm running Microsoft Office <laughs> and other things, you know, and you just <laughs> pick your battles, right? Um, but back then, it was like West Side Story. It was like, it was Jets like West Side Story. And sharks. Jets what? and Sharks. Jets, Jets and Sharks. Yes. yes. Yeah, absolutely. And so it was just like, you know, fire and ice and uh, – but you got to do what you got to do. And right. so it's funny. People, um, people ask Steve Jobs about what are they going to do in the future? Are you going to be a success? Whatever. He, he said so many prescient things. He would say the future is long. Mm. And you may mm. have heard quotes to the effect that success isn't forever and failure isn't forever either. Because in the moment, Apple had failed and was about to go on a business and Microsoft won. But... Unless you just freeze time, which you don't, you keep right. trucking along into the future. We all saw what happened. You know, consolidate the product line, make the iMac cool colors, come mm -hmm. out with the iPod, game changer there. I remember at Microsoft, we came up with something thing. It's called it's a punchline now. It's called the Zoom. <laughs> but yeah, people make fun of like on Family Guy or late night <laughs> TV back then. Um at the time when the iPod came out, we were like, MP3 players have been out for a while. We There's lots of them. It's no big right. deal. But remember, Apple has a cult. And right. Other don't. And that's more powerful than how good you're – remember, when you're branding and that following you have is more powerful than if your Betamax is better than VHS. <laughs> it is more powerful. And so it didn't matter if Microsoft made a better widget. Apple had this magnetism. They yes. had a following and the ads for the iPod, people dancing or thing. You're like, I want to be like them. Well, well, Rob, you know, uh, there's so much good. I wish we had several hours here, but you know how the word community is so cliche these days, but Apple, all, they had that to your point. I mean, folks could not wait to get their hands on the next or engage and, and, and with other Apple users. I mean, it was really, you're right. It was uh, magnetism is, is probably the best way to put it. You know, I have arguments with all my, you know, I know a million people at Microsoft and I argue with them. I say the high point for Microsoft was August of 1995. Big event on campus and launched Windows 95, Jay Leno, whatever. And I go, that was the high point of Microsoft. And they'll, and my friends there will say, no, it isn't. Our stock price is so much higher now. And we have the cloud and Azure and everything. I go, that's not the same thing. In the mind share of how, how the awesomeness, that was the first and only and last time that people were lined up at midnight to buy a copy of Windows 95. And Microsoft had a giant mind share. And Bill G was larger than life back then. Right. Um, you know who's funny is you know who was a, a vendor at that event at their little tiny booth showing off their new technology, Netscape. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Man, oh. who would have thunk? Who would have hey, thunk? Mark Andreessen, maybe this kid will do something that's going to blow up the whole thing. We talk Man. about disruption all the time. And all I always love to tell people, I do a lot of advising of startups. You hear about terms like black swans or barbarians at the gate. You should assume there are always barbarians at your gate and their little nothing product that you think is a toy maybe one day will eat your lunch. Well, and you need and to that take is all those things seriously, Rob. I'm with you, and that's such great advice because you know no, the story number three on our top five today was you know how Microsoft and Apple teamed up. But little as you are foreshadowing things, story number four is going to illustrate the point you just wrapped on. So tell us about the heights Apple hit back uh, in summer 2018. Yeah, so you get to 2018. So go to 97, all of 2018, and Apple becomes the first American publicly traded company to reach $1 trillion market cap. Wow. Whoa. 
Prior to that, there was only, and they weren't publicly traded, the largest company in the world that no one's ever heard of was Saudi Aramco. Uh, and so they were always number, but they weren't publicly, I think they might be now, but, uh, but it was such a big deal. Um, and it's, it is the power of that community. Um, but it's also the power of design and taste. Mm. And so it, functionality of the whatever widget you're selling isn't enough. Is it beautiful? Is it yep. simple to use? Is it mm. elegant? It turns out that stuff matters. And so that dynamic duo of Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive building the iPod, then building the iPhone, then building the iPad, what a revolution. But the, the props have to go to the iPhone. Yeah, The iPhone is the single most successful product in the history of products. Multi-trillion dollar product. Mm -hmm. Nothing else comes close to an iPhone. Now, you'll also notice over the years when you see Apple's growing quarterly earnings that are mind-blowing and their quarters are usually bigger than every other giant company's entire year. And you go, well, most of it came from this little phone. You right. know, it came from this. It, it, and, <laughs> and, and you're like, and in fact, you could, you know, you'd look and go, well, what is, what's Apple selling? You can put all of Apple's products on a little small coffee table. And focus, that's focus, focus, right? Absolutely. Just it, what does Steve Jobs always say? How it's important to say no. Right. Yes. And that's some of the best advice, whether you're an entrepreneur or no matter what you're doing, saying no and, and really maintaining that focus is such a, uh, a tough lesson learned sometimes. Let me ask you this, Tim. Uh, I'm uh, Rob. I'm, I'm about to ask you a question about Tim. Rob, um, about Apple. Would you also suggest, and I, I don't know the exact history here, but a, you know, Tim Cook, I yep. believe still leads Apple today. Yeah. Um, how important, I mean, the succession planning, and I'm not sure if Tim took over when Steve Jobs passed away in kind of that chapter, but clearly Tim's been up to the job to keep Apple on, on a certain trajectory and protecting the culture and the approach that you're, you're kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, spiking the football on. Speak to that if you would. Yeah. There's probably a little controversy around that. No one believes that Tim Cook is the creative genius that holds the soul of Apple at all. So Tim Cook, though, in your bailiwick, is a supply chain genius. Right. That's right. And I knew Tim Cook. I'm a Houston guy. Tim Cook was at Compact Computer, which is arguably the greatest computer company on the PC side ever. And he knew how to... Think about all the innovations that Dell and Compaq did way back when in getting that supply chain right and how they did just-in-time manufacturing. They, they led the way on that kind of stuff. Right. Early, early days before anybody knew about lean manufacturing or just-in-time this or that. So Tim right. Cook was brought into Apple to help right the ship under the hood. And so for, he was just a – I don't want to call him a foot soldier, but right. he was in charge of getting manufacturing done, building these factories – Think about all the stuff they did with Foxconn. He was operationally focused. Absolutely. Yeah. And so because he made that machine work. There's all, no shortage of controversy about why don't we build Apple products in the United States, right. you know? And so, but they, they get crazy margins when Foxconn makes them, right? Um, so Tim Cook was that guy. And Steve knew that he was, while he wasn't the soul of the company, he is one of the magic people that made them so profitable. Mm. A lot of people don't realize that they just see the product. They see food at a grocery store. They see things. They don't know how it gets to there. They think it's magic or it just oh, happens. Sure. And it doesn't just happen. Nope. And so Tim Cook is one of the best logistics supply chain geniuses in the history of that space ever. And he made it happen for them. And so to your question, he was made president before Steve Jobs died. There was a, you know, Steve Jobs was in and out of the hospital. And then there was that time where like he knew it was going to be, you know, he kept taking time off and stuff. And then there was that time when he knew this was it, you know, the cancer was going to get him. Mm. And so you had all these dignitaries, Bill Gates, all these people going to visit him and everything. And I think, gosh, it was probably a few weeks before he actually died where he told the board, I'm letting go. And I want Tim cook to take over the company. Wow. And I, and it, you know, I, I think he knew he was in good hands because he would keep the train going. A lot of people, you saw lots of analysts as soon as Steve jobs died, 
Apple's going to die with it. Right. He was the magic. Apple's stock tanked. Remember when it went down to the 90s? Great yep. time to buy it. Because <laughs> 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 that, didn't, that didn't last. <laughs> it sure um, didn't. But yeah, Tim Cook's been a great steward. Um, it, and Johnny Ive was kind of took over the mantle of the soul of the company. You know, obviously Wozniak hadn't, you know, been a major player in a long, long time. Right. Even though he's still around and stuff like that. Um, there's a book out right now. There's a lot of talk. You know, Johnny Ive is now out of the company. Wow. And, and so he was kind of the last vestiges of thinking about beautiful design and elegance and all that. And now Johnny's gone. There's books about, you know, are, are they going to die or whatever. Yeah, what's next? What's, yeah, what's next? exactly. Exactly. It really, you know, uh, one last thought here and, yeah. and then we'll move to the, the, the final um, topic for the sake of time. But it to see the gains that Samsung has made. Now, I've never had a Samsung, so I'm just looking sh sheerly at, at sales and revenue and and um, and what I hear anecdotally from folks that own a, a Samsung. You know, it's really interesting uh, to hear kind of your take on Tim and how he's kind of kept the, the steam engine moving. But the folks from other companies and the new visionaries and other companies that kind of going back to the Jenny Craig story. They're hopping on with what's selling the marketplace and they just find a better way to do it, huh? Yeah, yeah. You know, Samsung, I have Samsung devices. I go both ways, Android and iPhone, even though I was one of the people that brought you Windows phone with the tiles. Yes. <laughs> but I had lots of sand kicked in my face. Um, well, you can't you can't win them all. You and, can't and win that, them all. We and fought to be the here, fight. Man, we fought. to be here today. Because, yeah, you lost a few. But, man, if you go back uh, when we had that full interview with you, Rob, <laughs> you won plenty. Uh, <laughs> we're going to have to – you know, we need to – we need to. Um, we should dive deeper into some of your journey because you were surprising me with some of the – you know, some of the twists and turns. It's amazing what you've seen. It's amazing what you've been a part of. And uh, I really appreciate your time here today on and, and sharing biz history related to these devices that have permeated every aspect yeah. of my life. Samsung is killing it, but Samsung doesn't have the same community. That's right. And so you, it's weird. Android has far greater unit sales, um, but most Android devices are going to a different market segment. And the apps that people want right. are built for the iPhone first and the Android second. And they're oftentimes not as good. Interesting. Yeah. Hey, we struggled to get people to build apps for Windows Phone. We were like third in line. So I really? don't want that. Yeah. Well, and so, uh, yeah, you know, there are countries, I won't name any, Japan, that if you <laughs> you have to have an iPhone, it's a, it's a status thing. It's, wow. I don't want to call it a class defining thing. Right. But everybody has an iPhone. And, uh, it, you know, I remember doing executive briefings for companies in different countries in doing rail. And they'd have apps to make it easy for you to get on a train. And at some point they stopped making apps for the Android because they were so fraud ridden and all kinds of crazy stories. Okay. Uh, but yeah, Man. lots of stuff to go there one day. We're scratching the surface, the tip of the iceberg with Rob Tiffany. This is, this is exactly what I, I wanted to sign up for today in today's jam packed hour. So um, we're going to wrap on a, on a different and remotely related business story. But I believe this this gentleman we're going to be talking about is one of the nicest guys, most admired, most athletic, dominant athletes of of you know the modern age of basketball. And who am I talking about? Well, Rob, I'm talking about none other than David the Admiral Robinson. Uh, now, David Robinson was born August 6, 1965, in Key West, Florida. His father was in the U.S. Navy. So David and his family got used to the idea and, and the practice of, of moving quite often, much like Rob was in the U.S. Navy, and, and we'll touch on David and his service here in a minute. But once his father retired, the family settled down in Woodbridge, Virginia, and David Robinson would become known as an excellent student and athlete. But get this, he was a bit of a late bloomer or full-fledged full late bloomer in basketball. In fact, Rob, he didn't even really play the game in an organized fashion until real late in school, like his senior year, wow. Robinson was five foot nine inches tall as a high school junior, but an extraordinary growth spurt led him to being six foot six inches tall as a senior, less than a year later. And as the saying goes, you can't coach height. So once David Robinson was on the high school team, he he 
dominated. He excelled at sport. Uh, Robinson would go on. He didn't just need to – he had – plenty of natural athletic skills. He had the height, sure, but he went on to attend the U.S. Naval Academy where he almost led the midshipmen to the NCAA Final Four in 1986, playing against the you know, the the, the notable stars of the game of, of college basketball, coast to coast. Now, upon graduating, David Robinson was seven foot, seven feet tall, which, Rob, as you were talking earlier pre-show, a bit of a problem when it came to his obligations of serving in the Navy. He was too tall. For so many roles, the U.S. Secretary of Navy intervened because he had a commitment, right? He graduated from Naval Academy, he had a commitment. So the secretary intervened and David Robinson would be eventually assigned a civil engineering officer role at Naval Submarine Base Kings Bay right here or, or down the coast. Down the coast. Uh, here in Georgia. That's right. By the Florida Georgia line. That's uh, that's right. Uh, <laughs> and that's the thing, everybody. That's a really real thing. Um, so. Upon graduation from the academy, as he's already started to serve, the San Antonio Spurs made David Robinson their number one pick. In fact, that year he was number one pick in the whole lot of draft lottery. But they had to be patient and wait two years for him to finish his military military commitment, which he did. Now, let me pause there for a second. I've got a couple of his his uh, uh, accomplishments in a very full career, and then I'm going to touch on what he's doing kind of post basketball. But Rob, how cool! is this and what you know about David Robinson. I'll tell you here to the, this image here, I gave my brother yeah. this exact rookie card as he was getting into basketball collecting. I remember putting that Woo. card right there in the Christmas tree. I and love it. Letting you know to go, go look for it. And of course that's his uh, Olympic shot there. But Rob, that's how amazing. cool the Dave Robinson story on your end? It's amazing. I keep waiting for my to me to have that growth spurt that he had, you know, that didn't happen for me. It was like maybe in college, I don't know. Um, I'm, maybe it'll get there. Yeah. You know, the guy was a stud, you know, and yes, I remember in the Navy, I remember pictures of him being on a submarine. So Kings Bay is one of our two Trident submarine bases. And I've seen pictures on there, but you're right. It would be tough. He'd be banging his head a lot God. on a sub. And he certainly, you know, luckily we all know Tom Cruise is really short. So he's perfect <laughs> to be a fighter pilot. Um, and so he can fit in there. He's such a stud. He's such yes. a, he's what you want. He's such a great American. He's so well-rounded. He mm. so, excels. So, and I do remember those moments. I do remember when San Antonio picked him knowing they were just going to have to sit around and wait for him. You know, he had to, he had obligated service and, Gosh. but what, you know, so get this, get this. So his time. So, um, you know, of course his nickname, the Admiral, obviously dates to his time in the Navy and those connections there, but his NBA career to your point, Rob legendary. Yeah. He's a member of the NBA hall of fame. He's a 10 time NBA all-star. And again, I'm just grabbing a couple here, yeah. two championships. Uh, he got an MVP for the league in 1995, of course, Olympic gold medalist. He's named to the NBA's 50th and 75th anniversary teams in 96 and, yeah. and 2021 respectively. And again, just scrapping, scraping the tip of the iceberg, but you know what? What's cool about this, um, Rob, and, and we and I can't remember the guest that said this on one of our Veteran Voices episode, but oftentimes folks that serve in the military, they keep on serving. They might take the the you know the uniform off as they exit, but they keep on serving. That's what David Robinson has really done. Love it. Um, he founded Admiral Capital, which is, has ended up being a successful private equity group. It's made a variety of notable investments to include a company that I bet you you'll see especially during the holidays, 10 times a day on your television, Academy Sports and Outdoor. Man, that story has been remarkable, that growth. He founded the Carver Academy in San Antonio, which is now a tuition-free a tuition -free school, which is part of the local school system. And beyond serving on a variety of boards and committees, David Robinson has given millions of dollars back to the community. Mm. And all told, as I lit off this segment, uh, Robin, as, as you're also kind of alluding to, he's got to be, got to be at least in the modern era, one of the most admired universally athletes and leaders in all of yeah. American sports. David yes. Maurice Robinson, born August 6, 1965. So, Woof. Rob, your final word on, on the Admiral here. You know, it's interesting the, how he didn't – he wasn't a basketball guy and he just learned late in the game – there was another guy just down the road from San Antonio who arrived in Houston back in the 80s from Nigeria. His name was Akeem Olajuwon. Yes, the dream. He, 
he also didn't know how to play basketball. He was taught to play basketball by uh, Moses Malone, who was playing for the Rockets at the time while Akeem was at University of Houston. And then he and Clyde Drexler ended up doing the whole five slamma jamma thing. And right. The rest is history. But it is interesting how there's sometimes that certainly height helps, but we've seen really tall basketball players before who just really didn't have it. Right. Sure. So how, how great athletes and people with an open mind can learn lots of things quickly, even though they hadn't played it their whole lives. Uh, I always feel San Antonio gets sold short when it comes to NBA notoriety or basketball. It, people just forget because you're right. He won those. And then they kept winning more after him. That's right. But they don't get a lot of love. Other teams seem to get a lot of the, the glitz, you know, um, it's interesting. And of course, you know, he's, he's, you know, obviously we had Michael Jordan dominating in the nineties. Um, what a great guy. I love, oh, I, I love what he's doing now, you know, and you're so right about a lot of people with military service. You go in because you want to give to your country and then you don't stop giving when you get out. And so true. a lot of people don't know this little secret, but the more you give, the more you get. Oh man, Rob, what a great thought to leave on and a truth in life. And, you know, Rob, as we talked about last time we got together, because one of the things that, that hit my radar, uh, Rob, was something you were doing uh, with a nonprofit effort to bridge that digital divide. I mean, you do a lot of different things for uh, that give forward mentality, but that's such, that's going to be an even bigger need in the, in the months and years ahead. And, and I admire your service. I admire all the, all the cool things you're up to. And you're giving us an hour here today to, to kind of, What'd you call it? Power nerd out and talk business history a little bit. We kind of um, did that. Uh, so, Rob, wide ranging conversation. Again, we've got your social uh, in the episode notes. But what's the easiest way for folks to reach out to Rob Tiffany and plug into what you're doing? Probably the yellow pages. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I know we're right up against Tom. And thank you, uh, Catherine and Amanda, uh, for bearing with us here. And by the way, I love Catherine's comment. I'm five nine. I hope I don't get a growth spurt. I'm with you, Catherine. Um, but we saw this comic on Netflix. I can't remember her name. Uh, she was talking about how folks are, are nervous about giving up their data these days. And she made this joke, which I'm not, not going to do it justice. But back in the day, everyone gave up not only their phone number, but your physical address. Uh, address, And it was thrown on everybody's driveway from here, you know, from coast to coast. You know, that's, yep. what, that's a little bit worse than today, maybe. But um, Rob... Beyond the Yellow Pages, how can folks connect with you, you think? Just, uh, you know, you can certainly find me on LinkedIn, mostly. I'm on there, uh, at Rob Tiffany on Twitter. Um, go check out digitalinsights.ai. Okay. And the IoT Coffee, IoT Coffee Talk. Talk. Uh, yes, go, every go find that. Yeah, go to iotcoffeetalk.com, and then it redirects you to all our videos you know, that's what happens when you take three of the inventors of most of the big IoT platforms and then some smart analysts and you put them together and it turns out they're a bunch of smart asses. And, <laughs> and, and so that's what you get. Rob, and that's must see T -E TV. It, I mean, folks have gotten, they've gotten a sense of your, not only your, your smarts here, but your sense of humor, which you take those two combined and, and it makes for a very enjoyable conversation. Uh, we've got your, uh, digitalinsights.ai and we got iotcoffeetalk.com y'all check that out awesome uh, Rob Tiffany always a pleasure uh, really appreciate what you do admire your approach in doing it and I can't wait to hear about the next book and of course digital insights on the good work you're doing here today hey folks uh, if you're listening to this thanks for your time uh, hopefully you've enjoyed this uh, this fast and, and broad walk through business history uh, join us in two weeks, uh, 4 p.m. Eastern time, as we dive into more Biz History Live, make sure you connect and follow Rob Tiffany. And whatever you do, uh, Scott Luton signing off for all of our team here at This Week in Business History. Hey, do good, give forward, and be the change that's needed. On that note, we'll see you next time right back here at Biz History Live. Thanks, everybody.